But for tonight and for the rest of June, we're going to finish up the book of Revelation, and we're going to do it in style. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Would you please rise and stand in honor of God's word for our initial and primary reading of it today? This is the word of the Lord. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, abound him for a thousand years. He threw him into a pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. (coughs) Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded For the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. (coughs) Last week, we looked at one of the most exciting sections of Scripture in the entire Word of God. We read about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory in the battle of Armageddon over the enemies of God. In that text, after witnessing the destruction of the Babylonian world system, which we covered in Revelation 17 and 18, we watched its participants get absolutely incinerated by the words coming from Jesus' mouth. The Antichrist and false prophet were thrown into the lake of fire with the rest of the, um, uh, well, soon to be the rest of the unbelieving world. Jesus has returned, and he is victorious over evil and darkness. But if you take note, there is still one nefarious individual, the chief one, to combat that wasn't dealt with in chapter number 19, and that's Satan himself. And that's where we'll start off with in chapter number 20. Jesus is now going to deal with Satan and establish what's called the millennial kingdom. And the way that he deals with Satan is a bit different than how he dealt with the Antichrist and false prophet. His sentencing at this particular point is temporary and is not eternal, at least yet. It's temporary, but it does last for a long time. If you read scripture literally in this occurrence, it will last for a thousand years. Now, before I go any further, I have to remind you something that I have to remind you on occasion as we go through Revelation. I interpret Revelation, the apocalyptic text of Revelation, through a certain lens that is an open-handed gray area that people who are much smarter than I will either agree or disagree with. That lens is called, this is a fancy theological term, premillennial dispensationalist. Here's what that means. When I read Revelation, I read it literally first. I prioritize a literal interpretation of the text. Unless it is clear that what it's talking about is figurative or illustrative. If it's figurative or illustrated and it's forced, like obviously it's figurative, then I will interpret it figuratively. I have brothers uh, and sisters who are much smarter than I am that both agree with me and disagree with me. Some will take the more figurative approach than the literal approach. When we all get to heaven, we'll find out I was right. I'm just kidding. Um, We'll we'll find out we were all probably a little bit wrong about everything. But in that, know that that. When I'm going through Revelation, I'm, I'm, I'm depending on the Holy Spirit to help me stick to the main point of the book of Revelation, and that's found in the first five words of the book. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm bringing everything about the book back to Christ. 
But when we go through elements and details, sometimes my premillennial dispensationalist will come out and how I view the text. So the reason why I say that is when it says the devil was wrapped up for a thousand years, I take that literally, that that's literally what is going to happen, okay? So that's, that's sort of my preemptive deal. There's some people that are smarter than I am, a lot smarter than I am, that would both agree and disagree. So if, what, do you, what is premillennialism? This is historic premillennialism, which is where I land. <coughs> Jesus' birth, kingdom of God manifests in the flesh, Okay, you have the ascension. So after Jesus' resurrection, he goes to be with the Father. Kingdom remains through the Holy Spirit. This is the church age. We are somewhere in here right now. Then there's an apostasy and tribulation that breaks out. This is the seven-year tribulation. Okay, this is actually a time period. Then the return of Christ. Some would say, when's the rapture? Well, that's another viewpoint that can vary. You can be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or a-trib. Okay, or pan trib. There's all sorts of tribs. At the end of the day, I lean not dogmatically. I lean towards pre-trib rapture. Although there's sometimes post makes a lot of sense too. So I'm just gonna say I really don't know. I'm a pan trib guy. It's all gonna pan out in the end. Okay. Um, regardless of what happens. So at the end of this, Jesus Christ is going to return. I do know that's going to happen. That's absolutely clear. This is called the first resurrection. After this happens, there's going to be the millennium. Literally means a thousand years. Satan is bound. The kingdom is consummated. It will be a reign of where Satan is locked up. Christ reigns supreme. At the end of that millennium, Satan is loose. There's a massive rebellion led by Gog and Magog. That's what we're talking about today. This time period right here. And it's so interesting for the last two years, we've spent our time here. And now today, we're going to spend our time here. <laughs> Doesn't seem quite balanced, right? But that's, that's just how the text lays. <coughs> There'll be a final rebellion. And then we'll talk about this next week, the final great white throne judgment, which includes the second resurrection, and the final stage, the new heaven and the new earth. Those things will make a little bit more sense once we process the rest of the text for the remainder of June. All right, so let's jump into our text and see what we've got. Revelation 21. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his key, his hand, the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain. We're not sure who the angel is. It's likely Michael, the archangel, one of the primary opponents found in scripture for the devil himself. These two are always fighting against each other. The two angels are often depicted by theologians to be opposite equals. What I mean by that is that Michael is what Lucifer, which is, which is what Satan used to be called when he was an angel. Michael is what Lucifer should have been. <coughs> Lucifer tried to overthrow God and found pride and rebellion in, our, in his heart. And so he was cast out of heaven and called Satan. Okay, he's the black sheep of the family. Anybody got a black sheep of the family? Are you the black sheep of the family? Who knows? But Satan is the black sheep of the family. He's been kicked out. Michael is the one that stayed back and obeyed God. Scholars believe that Michael and Lucifer were close, they were probably friends, and they probably served alongside each other in the kingdom with an equal level of archangel authority before Lucifer decided to rebel against God. The bottomless pit is abusos. We've talked about this before. It's an abyss. Uh, this is the same place. This is a temporary holding prison for the worst and most vile of demons. We talked about this back in the trumpet judgments when the demonic locusts were let out of the abyss. This is the same location that, that we're talking about, the abyss or the abusos. Verse 2, and he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, about him for a thousand years. So all of these names, he's called four different names here. All of them speak to his character, his evil his intent to bring rebellion against the kingdom of God. And he's bound in the abyss for a thousand years. Again, if you read this literally, this is the length of time of Christ's millennial reign. That's why it's called millennial reign. I see no reason to not interpret it literally. Some do. That's beside the point. Verse three. <coughs> and threw him into a pit, shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So Satan is locked up in God's prison for the most vile of demons. His ability to deceive the nations is completely halted. 
Remember this. Remember, Satan is not omnipresent like God is. That means where God is everywhere at all times and is not limited to space, Satan is not. He's limited to space. If he, if he needs to go from one place to another, he has to get in his, his little devil car and travel there, okay? I don't know how he transports himself, but he has to. He has to move from one place to another, point A to point B. He's not God. He can't be everywhere at all time. He's also not omniscient. God knows everything. He is, not, he is not limited in knowledge or wisdom. Satan is, though he is very wise. He's been around for a long time. He has a lot of information. He's not all-knowing. He's also not omnipotent. This is a quality about God where he is not limited in power. He can do anything he wants at any time. Okay? Obviously, he's, not, he's confined within his character attributes. He's not going to be who he's not always been. But he has the power to do anything he wants. Satan does not have that type of power. He is very powerful, but he's not, <coughs> he's not infinitely powerful. So he's not God. He cannot do the things that God does. If he's locked up in the abyss... He's going to stay locked up in the abyss. He doesn't have the capability of getting out. Satan cannot get out until God lets him out, and he will. And we'll talk about that in a second. Satan will have no ability for these thousands of years, this, this thousand years, to influence humanity. Now, some of you might be thinking, that doesn't matter. Everyone died in the Battle of Armageddon. Go back to chapter 19. Remember. What happened? All of the armies of evil, led by the Antichrist and the false prophet, approached Jesus to take on Christ. What did Christ do? He incinerated all of them with the word of his mouth in a second and, dis- and completely defeated the unbelieving world. So who is out there for Satan to do, to, to, to influence, to, to coerce? Everyone died, right? No. Not correct. All of the unsaved, unregenerate, unrepentant sinners did die alongside their master, the Antichrist. But there will still be Christians that survive bodily the tribulation. And they will go into, hang with me, the new millennium alive, having never died. There will be survivors. Only believers, only redeemed, only Christians. All of the survivors will be Christians. They will be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, even, if they, even though they haven't died yet. They're still going to, there's going to be survivors. That's really important to some things that's going to be confusing here in a little bit. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast in its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads and on the hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, with Satan and, demon out of, and, and his demons out of the way and locked up, all of the God-hating sinners are dead. The millennial kingdom of peace and righteousness will be established. The ruler of that kingdom is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle John looks out and he sees thrones and seated on them were those whom whom the authority to judge was committed. Who are the people during the millennial kingdom that get to sit on thrones and rule and judge the world during the millennial kingdom? Scripture tells us who gets to rule and judge. All we have to do is look at the totality of Scripture and see that God has already promised certain groups of people they'd be able to rule. Daniel 7, 27, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. There are numerous Old Testament promises made to Old Testament saints that they would reign and rule during the millennial kingdom. The apostles were given the same promise. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The apostles have also been guaranteed a spot to judge during the millennial kingdom. We will also see that New Testament believers... Some New Testament believers will be allowed to rule. Revelation 2.26, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority 
over the nations. 321, the one who conquers, I will grant him to set with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. 510, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. There are promises to the Old Testament saints, prophets, leaders, patriarchs, New Testament apostles, and some New Testament believers, they will sit on thrones and judge the world during this millennial reign. <coughs> now, there will be, seem to be particular individuals throughout that time that will, God will use to, to judge during that time. As there has always been in God's kingdom, there's order. Christ will rule with order. It will be by his law, but he will use his faithful saints and put them in positions of authority to rule and execute his law. Those on thrones of judgment will keep the order by executing the laws of God. Their jobs will be somewhat easy with Satan out of the way. Everyone in this utopian type of situation, Satan not there to tempt, everyone will follow God's laws without having to be forced. Think about it. People will worship the way they're supposed to. They will conduct relationships the way that they're supposed to. It's a perfect paradise of holiness. John also sees the martyred saints of the tribulation when he talks about the souls that of those who have been beheaded. Because of the faithfulness of these saints, they are made alive <coughs> in a true resurrection along with the rest of the saints of the Old and New Testaments. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Some people attribute this verse to the rapture. I think you can, but I think it's safer to attribute this to the return of Christ. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, that means those who have already passed on, will rise first, it's a resurrection, then we who are alive, so those who are still around, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. We read about this in Revelation chapter 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, All those who died in Christ, the so Christians who have died, will be raised to life eternally, will partake in the glory of the millennial kingdom. The Greek here shows that this is not a spiritual resurrection, Okay, going back to our original verse, it's not a spiritual resurrection. It's a physical one. Anastasius is used 42 times in the New Testament. It always refers to a physical resurrection. That's what's used here. It's not a spiritual resurrection. It's, but what do you do with the people who's been in the ground for thousands of years and have returned to dust and don't even exist? Well, God's sovereign. And I'm sure he knows every speck and every particle of dust that their body was consumed and brought into. He can pull it back together, give them a new heavenly body, and resurrect them. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm really excited about the idea of getting a new heavenly body anyway. I'm going for a new look, okay? And so that's what I'm aiming for. Maybe more of a Jason Malmoa type of deal than what I've got now. But there's a new heavenly body that is, that, that is, that is going to be resurrected in that. So let's catch up here. Who's where? I know this is a lot of information. So let's, let's pause for a second and let's, let's find out who's where. The Antichrist and false prophet, they're in the lake of fire. They're physically killed in their first death. They're now experiencing never-ending eternal conscious torment in the second death. Okay? How about all the unrepentant sinners that, were, that, that have ever existed, ever lived, Old New Testament era, and then were incinerated, the final batch of them, at the Battle of Armageddon? They're in hell. That's not their final destination. We'll get to that later. They're going to be resurrected out of hell for the great white throne judgment, and then they're going to go to the lake of fire and join the Antichrist and false prophet. We're not there yet, though. So this is, that's why I included not final. <coughs> At this point, all, where are all the saints that have died physically? Old, New Testament, all the ones who passed away during the tribulation, before the tribulation, well, they are physically resurrected and reigning and ruling with Christ during the millennium. They're the ones sitting on the thrones, ruling with Christ. How about the saints that survived the tribulation? They didn't die when the tribulation occurred. Well, they're living on earth during the millennium, saved and redeemed, but not ruling. Okay? 
they experience the the uh, the the. Uh, some saints remain physically alive, sur- survive the tribulation. They are living on earth during the millennial kingdom. They are saved, they're redeemed, they belong to God, but they don't appear to be in a spot to rule or have authority in, in that particular time. They're, they're living like we are now, except for it's a millennial kingdom. Now, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the millennial kingdom like? Uh, first of all, there's peace. There's no war. All nations will unify and the result will be economic prosperity. There will be personal and national peace. Isaiah 60, 18, violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. There will be joy, the fullness of joy, contentment with the, and contentment. It will be the trademark of the millennial kingdom. Isaiah 14, <coughs> the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into, break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. There'll be holiness. This will be a holy kingdom. And the holy Lord Jesus Christ reigns over all. Satan is locked up. This will be a holy kingdom. The land will be holy. The people will be holy. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. There'll be perfect justice. Perfect justice will be administered through the entire land according to the word of God. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throat of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from the time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The curse of sin will be removed. If you go back to Genesis 3, you'll see some of the curse. And Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your faith, you shall face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall <coughs> return. And then for Eve, the curse was pain during childbirth. You will constantly strive against the authority of, of your husband. All of that sort of stuff is built into the curse. And so the curse of sin will be removed. It will be removed. It will be no more. Um, sickness will not exist. Isaiah 65, 25 uh, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of the holy mountains, says the Lord. That's part of the peace that will be a part of it. Sickness will not exist. Isaiah thirty three twenty five. and no inhabitant will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. There's going to be no more hunger or economic poverty. There's only going to be prosperity. And the great thing is without the devil around, that prosperity won't turn into idolatrous wealth. Okay? It will be something that actually sustains us and is holy. Isaiah 35, 1 through 2, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy. And singing, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. It is estimated that the value of the combined mineral and natural resources of the earth. If you pull every single resource, every single mineral, everything of the earth all together, it would equal one decillion dollars. One decillion. Have you ever heard that term, decillion? Okay, so here's what you got. You got got the first three numbers, okay? Then you have thousands. Then you have millions. You guys heard of millions, right? Billions. What comes next? Trillions. What comes next? Quadrillion. Anybody know what comes after quadrillion? Sextillion. You know? Oh, did you get it right? I I was super impressed if you got that right. Sextillion. What comes next? Septillion. Octillion. Novillion. Then decillion. If everyone on earth had equal shares of all of the value of earth's resources, everyone, every, all the seven billion people on this planet would be millionaires. With sin out of the way and Satan gone, no more demons, a righteous and fair judge overseeing the operation of the world, everyone will have plenty. There will not be a hungry stomach in the entire kingdom. 
no more poverty, no more starving children. Everyone will have what they need. Everyone will speak the same language. Uh, and this time there won't be a threat like there was at the Tower of Babel for, for rebellion. Zephaniah 3.9, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. This also speaks to a united worship, that we will all worship together. There won't be different denominations. There won't be different um, um, things, different preferences. We will all worship in unity. Amongst all those things, there is something interesting that will still be occurring during the millennial age. People will still be reproducing. The survivors of the tribulation will continue to have kids. Jeremiah 30, 20, the children shall be as they were of old, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all those who oppose them. In fact, <coughs> it's likely going to be the case, as we will see later in our text, that the population of the earth, which was severely decreased by the events of the tribulation, will pave the way for this rapid repopulation from the believers who survived the tribulation. Because of the removal of the curse of sin, people will live a long time. There will be no death. They'll survive the entire millennial kingdom as flesh human beings, the full length of it. I know it's really crazy for us to think about because we're trapped inside of this era where there is the curse of sin, but there won't be death in that regard, and they will repop. A thousand years is a long time to repopulate the earth. Isaiah 65, 20, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days for the young man shall die 100 years old and a sinner 100 years old shall be accursed. What an amazing kingdom and time this will be. Truly glorious, the best years of human existence under the rule of Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's go back to our text, five and six. The rest of the dead, oh my gosh, here's another group of dead people. What do we do with that? Okay, it's, it get really confusing to keep up with all the dead people. <clears throat> the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So verse five, this group of dead people, that's the unbelievers that will remain spiritually dead in hell. They will be brought back for final judgment. Okay, so hang with me on that. All believers will serve and reign with Christ in his glorious millennial kingdom. There is, however, one big footnote. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. Things are about to get super interesting. If you were fascinated by everything up to this point, just wait. Now Satan's back out. And he's got one final job that he wants to get done. Verse 8, he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. What? Millennial kingdom. Only believers went into the millennial kingdom as survivors. They repopulate the earth. They're living in perfect utopia perfect holiness, ran by the law of God, judged by the prophets of God. They live in a completely holy thousand-year reign where Christ rules, Satan is locked up. And Satan gets out and deceives a number like the sand of the sea? We're doing this again? This situation presents a really important question. <coughs> Who is Satan deceiving? Wasn't everyone left saved? The Bible says, if possible, the elect would be deceived. That means what? The elect, the saved, cannot ultimately be deceived. Now, we can go into backsliding. We can fall into sin. We can trip ourselves up and become confused. But ultimately, Christ always brings us back to the truth. Does this mean even after being saved once, we can still fall into the snare of Satan and go to hell? Do we have to do this again? All right, let's step back for a second. Everything we know about God doesn't change. Even at this point, he never changes. He's immutable. So, is it true that everyone on earth at the beginning of the millennial reign, at the beginning, are either resurrected saints that have died and been redeemed, 
or Christians that survive the tribulation? Yes. So who are the ones that Satan is deceiving? Those people's kids that were born from the believers during that time. Remember earlier we said that people were still repopulating the earth. Well, these people haven't been fully sanctified, which means they're flesh and blood like me and you. Me and you, what problem do we have that the, the ones who have died and been fully sanctified don't have? We still have what? An inherent sinful nature given to us by our father, Adam. And if I procreate, I pass that inherent sinful nature to my children through the bloodline because I'm still alive. These people are not fully sanctified, infused with the righteousness of God. They still have a sinful nature which they pass on to their children. But Josh, I thought you said there was no sinning or corruption during the millennial kingdom. Yes, that's true. People will follow God. <coughs> Excuse me. But those born with a sinful nature will still need to be redeemed by placing their faith in Christ. Some will, most won't. And even though all the inhabitants on earth will obey God's sovereign rule, there will be a massive number of these children born during the millennium that won't want to. They have to, but they don't want to. And as soon, and that will be held, people won't know who those people are because outwardly they will follow the rules. They have to. Christ is in charge. There is no rebellion allowed. They will have to follow the rules. And some will do it willingly because they love God and some will do it because they have to, but secretly they hate God because they are still with a sinful nature. And so as soon as Satan is let back out, He's going to go to the four corners of the earth and go, ha ha, you're my child, you're my child, you're my child. I know it, I see it in you. You've just been waiting for a provoker, a, 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 an authority of the evil demonic realm to come and draw that rebellion out of you. And he's going to go and provoke every single one of them, gather his army, and here we go again, Battle of Armageddon 2. Satan will find all the unregenerate believers that love their sin more than God and bring them together one last time. It's hard to fathom that a person that knows nothing but a perfect utopia of the Lord Jesus' paradise would ever want to rebel against them and choose Satan. But that's what sinners do. It would be hard to imagine God coming in the flesh, staring at you in your face, and killing him. But that's what sinners do. There will still be children born of the original tribulation survivors, though their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents were Christians, they will seek to kill Christ again. This is the sad state of human depravity. And why does God do all this? I, I, I don't know why. Here's a thought. I think he's showing us, even when I give you paradise, sin will still make you hate me. And for the one who loves their sin more than Christ, they will always be a rebel of the kingdom. And so I can even give human beings a perfect thousand years and they still will turn their backs on me. I think that's what God is showing us. To love sin is to reject God. And the truth is more people will love their sin and choose it and its consequences over bowing to Christ, including this group. Their number is like the sand of the sea. We're not talking about a small little rebellion. We're not talking about Cousin Joey and a few of his rebellious friends that, that snuck some things around while the millennial kingdom was going on. We're talking about a massive Millions and millions of rebels. They complied because they had to, but in their hearts, they hated God. And once they had someone come along and entice them to rebellion, they jumped on that train as fast as you could say, come on board. That's human depravity. That's you and me. 
We're no better. Thankfully, God reached down and saved us and shook us out of that. It's going to be too many to count. Only God can count this number. <coughs> Gog and Magog is a symbolic title for an invasion force. A lot of people have tried to make Gog and Magog like China and Russia. At this point, I don't think China and Russia is around. This is after the millennial kingdom. I think all of the earthly kingdoms of the world are completely destroyed and gone. We're talking about those nations are gone. Nine, and they marched up over the broad plain. Here we go again. Fools. If we didn't learn anything from a thousand years ago, when God literally incinerated these fools with the word of his mouth, here come these rebellious fools. We're going to take God on it this time. We're going to get them. Last time we just had the Antichrist and the false prophet, but now we got their daddy, Satan. So we're going to get something done. Sure. They march up over the broad plain of the earth like the biggest idiots in the world, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire... Okay. But f- fire... Whoa, I lost my... There we go. Fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Didn't learn our lesson the first time, did we, folks? Just like the first battle of Armageddon, it isn't a fight, it's a slaughter. Fire comes down from heaven. Jesus doesn't even get involved this time. He's just like, whatever. Satan, the master deceiver, is finally dealt with. And the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the permanent resting place, not resting, (laughs) torture place, and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So in summary, (coughs) I know this is a lot. Honestly, this is one of the most confusing portions of text in Revelation. And we tried to do our best with it in 30 minutes. In summary, Christ will establish his millennial kingdom. He will reign for a thousand years after binding Satan in the abyss. The redeemed saints of the Old and New Testament eras that died will be resurrected bodily and live eternally with Christ. Okay? The Christian survivors of the tribulation will have children, some of which will find Christ and be redeemed. Others won't. Though they're tied to the rules of the kingdom and obedience is expected, in their hearts they will secretly hate God. Satan will be released. He will gather all of them from the four corners of the earth, the the unredeemed, from one last hurrah. It fails miserably. The battle of Armageddon 2 ends like the battle of Armageddon 1. All of the rebels are incinerated as Satan joins his cronies, the Antichrist and false prophet, in the lake of fire. Jesus wins. He is victorious above all. And after the final rebellion, what we'll cover next week is that all of the people in hell will be brought out and brought before the judgment seat of God where their souls will be eternally judged. And their final destination will be the lake of fire. Eternal conscience punishment that awaits unrepentant sinners for their hatred and rebellion against God. So, a couple things with this, and then, and then we'll transition here. Um, let me do this, let me do this. Let me ask this question. I think when people walk away from this text, Here's the biggest question that people roll in their minds and, and are, are become dissatisfied with. You're telling me I can get saved in this era and then possibly at some other point there's a chance for Satan to come and deceive me again. Is that true? No. If you, are, if you belong to Christ, Christ said, Father, the, the ones that the Father have given me, I will not lose a single one of them. Okay. And so if he has saved you, if he has redeemed you, you are his. Now, we can get in this whole, it's a whole conversation. I, I did a, an, a video on it during Unpopular last year about predestination. Okay, it's a longer conversation. We don't have time to unpack the whole deal now. <coughs> it's a doctrine of grace, the perseverance of all saints. At the end of the day, um, if a person does not endure until the end, my stance would be they were never saved to begin with. They had a form of religion, but denied the power thereof. Those who endure till the end, even though we have seasons of struggle, backsliding, different things like that, but those who endure till the end, those are the ones who are truly saved, and I believe those who are truly converted, saved, born again, they have the power of the Holy Spirit to hold them 
under Christ. He does not lose one of his sheep. He brings them around to the end, okay? Now, I, people would disagree with me on that. That's fine. We can, we can, again, get to heaven and find out I'm right and they're wrong. But um, I'm kidding. I don't mean that. I mean that we're probably all a little wrong. But in this, what I want you to see is I don't want this fear to strike you. Oh, cool. After the tribulation and everything and I die, uh, or maybe I'm one of the survivors if this thing gets underway pretty quickly and I survive, you're telling me that there's a chance that Satan can come out and deceive me again. No. The Bible very, very clearly says, if possible, even the elect would be deceived. People often misquote that. They'll say, even the elect will be deceived. No, if possible. Now, that doesn't mean we can't get confused. That doesn't mean that we can be deceived in little chunks. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the truth of God's word, the truth of our salvation, the genuine saving faith is not something that's possible to be removed from us. Christ, nobody can take Christ from us. They can take us out of this world, but they can't take us out of Christ's hands. And so sometimes Christians will come away from this text and confuse and be like, oh, cool, do I got to get saved again? Do I got to fight the devil again? No. If you're in Christ, whether you die before the tri tribulation or you go into the millennial kingdom still alive, I, I think most of us is probably not going to be the issue unless stuff starts happening now. Completely possible. But at the end of the day, you're saved, you're redeemed. There's nothing to worry about in that, in that regard. What we're talking about here in this deception is the kids of the people that entered into the millennial kingdom. Those are the ones that are unregenerate, haven't chosen Christ, that will be in the final battle of Armageddon too. I want to make that clear. Does that make sense? This is a discussion, so I'm opening it up. Does that make sense? I think Christians get concerned with that. Oh, cool, I'm going to have to fight Satan again. Nope. You're saved. You're in God's kingdom. That's not going to come back around. He has sealed you with his Holy Spirit. Like he, is, he has got you in the palm of his hand. He's not going to lose you. Um, you, you this is not a, I'm going to have to fight Satan again sort, sort of situation. Does that make sense? I don't want anybody to walk away with that sort of fear um, or, or, or understanding theologically of what's going on here. Um, the likely truth is, is if, if we pass away in this life, there may be some of us ruling, there may be some of us uh, just in the kingdom, enjoying God's presence, but we are eternally redeemed, saved, sanctified fully by the Lord Jesus Christ. We're kept. We're not have to worry about that. Satan's not, we're not going to be on the host of people that Satan's going to deceive. I want to make sure that makes sense because that's, that's the big thing that people walk away from this particular text really confused on. <clears throat> Any questions regarding this text? We got a couple of minutes. I know it's I know it's a lot. Uh, any questions? Yeah. 